Good day, and welcome to the CIM webinar featuring Indigenous women leaders. Today, we'll be talking about the path towards fair and inclusive collaboration. My name is Mary Lou Raboulis, Client Relations at CIM. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I am on the traditional and unceded territory of the Canyon Quejaca, a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst nations, and most of us attending today are also on traditional unceded territory. Thank you for joining us. We are pleased to inform you that this webinar will be recorded and will be available on the Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Commission webpage on the CIM um, website. Some housekeeping before we get started. If you join with your computer audio, make sure you selected the computer audio button on the control panel. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat box in the control panel. The questions we will be addressed at the end of the session. And now without further ado, we'd like to present the moderator of the session, Lana Eagle. Lana is, is a respected Aboriginal relations strategist with extensive experience helping Aboriginal groups build sustainable communities and economies for future generations. She believes that Aboriginal communities and industries can work together, focusing her work on facilitating partnerships that create economic development strategies and address skills and employment challenges. Welcome, Lana. Good morning. Hmm. Today, one of our speakers is Carrie Lentowich. Uh, Carrie is a First Nations woman from Peter Ballantyne Cree Nations in Northern Saskatchewan. A Jill of all trades, Carrie has 20 years of experience in the mining industry and currently runs her own consulting company. And she will talk a little bit about herself in a few moments as well. And our next speaker is, is Frida Campbell. She's a member of the Tahtan Nation belonging to the Dekhama family and is a Crow clan. She's a community relations specialist focusing on capacity, capacity development and the engagement of indigenous workforce. Frida has an EMBA in indigenous business and leadership from Simon Fraser University and is currently working for Skeena Resources Limited on the SK Creek revitalization project. And she will also be speaking about herself in a few moments as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Lou. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be in front of you again. Well, it's Monday morning, right? Or is it Tuesday morning? It's Tuesday morning. It gets to be that way sometimes. Um, but I am really happy to be uh, moderating this panel today. And um, I am calling you today from Campbell River, which is located in the traditional lands of the Tkwaka, the Wewekai, and the Wewekam people. And uh, it is an honor and a privilege to work here every day and to be um, more or less self-isolated here. I think the world is transitioning back uh, to what it used to be. And I think I'm starting to see that uh, with some of the companies that I work with and some of the communities that I work in. So without further ado, I would like to um, talk to our guest today. Uh, Mary Lou gave us um, um, a very um, elementary introduction into who they are. So maybe I'll start with Carrie. I just met Carrie a couple of days ago and um, she is definitely full of energy as she um, builds her company, Diamonds in the Rough. And I'd like you, Carrie, just to talk a bit about what it is that you do and what your goals are for your company. Okay, so uh, I'd like to acknowledge that I am from Treaty 10 territory in Northeastern Saskatchewan, uh, home of the uh, Rocky Cree. I'm part of the Morassi clan, which stems out of Pelicanero Sask. And as you said earlier, I'm a member of the Peter Ballantyne Cree Nation. Um, with, uh, like you said, I run my own consulting company, um, which is dedicated towards emergency management and quality consulting. But I also run a nonprofit called Diamonds in the Rough. Uh, it's, it was uh, an idea that was conceived back in 2007. And I gave, it's the only baby I've ever given birth to. Um, <laughs> and, uh, oh, I love and, her. Yeah, so uh, in 2018, we uh, we formed Diamonds in the Rough, which is a nonprofit dedicated to raise, raising awareness on diversity, equity, inclusion in the mining industry through the vehicle of Mine Rescue. Now, what we do is we train women in mine rescue from across Canada, and we uh, 
we basically put them through competitions, training and competitions, and increase their confidence, their skill level, and uh, really their their leadership ability as well. It's proven to be a pretty good training program. And through the competitions, we showcase what women can do in mine rescue, which is traditionally a very, very uh, big boys club, but um, we competed in Russia in 2018 and did very well there. We came in fifth in the underground and out of 25 teams overall, we came in 15th. And uh, the best part about it was uh, at the beginning, we were kind of treated like novelty, but at the end, um, nobody was embarrassed to be beat by us. And we were seen as very competent people to do the same job. We work smarter, not harder. We train a little differently to work with the strengths that we have, and we really work as a team. And I think we've been able to, to show what we've been, what we're capable of. And through that as well, um, one of the interesting things is out of the 14 countries that participated, uh, it's illegal for women to work in um, underground in seven of those countries. And with Russia, we were the first women to actually perform work underground because it's still illegal there as well. So we've got a long way to go in industry with uh, women in, in those roles, uh, especially the non-traditional roles that are there. And I think we're, we're making progress, but definitely not as fast as I'd like to see it. <laughs> so you're really um, breaking barriers, if you will. We're trying to, yes. Right, so, so in that framework, Carrie, of you know, breaking barriers and um, mine rescue and, and that, so how does, um, equality, diversity, and inclusion, those sort of buzzwords that we use so often today in industry, what does that really mean to you? Well, basically with diversity, we want to see more people in the industry that are uh, of minorities uh, from different sexes to um, or different genders, I guess, as well. Uh, different races, uh, different ethnic backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, because it's proven that it really makes the workplace safer, more productive and increases the bottom line. So why wouldn't a company want to do it? Uh, it's better for, for all of us. Um, and mining is a very much uh, important industry. We can't do anything without it. The uh, technology we're all using today depends on it. A lot of people are, aren't aware of it. And if we wanna keep going within mining, we need to make it a safer industry because even one, one injury isn't enough or is too much and uh, one death is way too many, so. Let's make it safer, more productive, and keep this world afloat with what we produce. Great. Thank you, Carrie. Good morning, Frida. And where are you joining us today from? Good morning. Um, I'm joining you today from my traditional territory, um, Taltan Territory and community of Dees Lake. Oh, well, it's really good to see you. So Frida um, has had an interesting um, career path and now finds herself in the world of mining. And I know you've had previous experience in mining. So maybe maybe just tell our audience a bit about yourself and, and the work that you do now at Skeena. Okay. Um, I got into mining in 1994, actually. So I've been at it a long time. And um, I've somewhat specialized in working in my own traditional territory. Um, and working towards in engaging the Indigenous workforce in mining, um, I've, uh, I've tried to find different ways to assess skills um, to, so employers can um, see the Indigenous workforce in, in, a, in a different light. I believe the Indigenous workforce is very skilled, especially those from remote communities. Um, and, and you can't always see that in the resume. So um, I've, uh, I've done a lot of work in that area. We created on track. It's, uh, it's a skills inventory that um, allows the participants to um, do essential skills tests, um, which, um, which I believe will, that reveals, um, well, it reveals essential skill levels. Um, and at least you can line up your essential skill levels with the essential skill level profiles in the National Occupation Codes database. So you can literally see if a person is capable of performing the tasks that are required in, in mining positions. And, um, and I've worked for, um, I've worked at Red Chris and uh, 
the hydroelectric project projects in the territory. And this is my second time working at SK Creek. I was there for 14 years the first time. <laughs> so, um, and I try and find ways to, um, to create policies and procedures that support our IBAs um, on, on the ground, um, with, uh, on the front line in the workplace. So it's kind of what I've been doing. Wow, that sounds really interesting. It's amazing how time goes by. <laughs> it's amazing how time goes by so quickly. And then during this pandemic, I think I, I learned how time can go by so slowly, seemingly when, when we lack that human contact. But very, very interesting. So you know that in the workforce, we're using the buzzwords, uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion. So maybe uh, Frida, just talk a little bit about how a company like Skina is really moving in that direction and, and really what it requires from any mining company to become more inclusive, to become more diversified, and certainly to be more considerate of equality. If you can talk a bit about, you know, the things that um, SK, or pardon me, that um, Skina has done at SK within the Tall Tan Territory, as well as um, how that might happen in other companies that are wondering how they can do a better job at this? Um, well, diversity is a proven driver of better, better performance. And there is no diversity without inclusion. Un inclusion is the key that unlocks diversity. Um, you can, you know, you can hire um, different, different, different groups, different genders and all those things, but you really need for you really need employees to feel included <laughs> um, and and that will um, that will bring out when employers feel cared about and included that creates the arena for um, for innovative decision making um, and and innovative and creative problem solving and right now um, in the mining industry with um, um, UNDRIP and DRIPA and free informed prior consent, we have never needed more. We really need to be innovative and creative and, and, and do some problem solving. Um, I don't think, I've been in the industry since 1994 and I've never seen this where we're at right now. And um, Skina is a wonderful company to work for. Um, it's really great to be able to uh, come back to SK Creek. The first time I, you know, I seen a lot of uh, problems. I seen ways we could have done things better, and I get to actually try and do that, <laughs> which is, which is really exciting. But um, Skina really, really um, backs up their um, their their inclusion and in di in diversity. We have, um, let's see, we have we have surpassed industry averages for percentages we have uh 21 percent indigenous and uh i think i think the industry average is is nine percent and we have 28 percent female and i think the industry average is 16 percent so skina backs that up with um with actually putting their their money where their mouth is and, and hiring in that fashion um and we um we are we are also on site requiring that anybody in a supervisory position do the be better than um be better than a bystander program so that's being rolled out right now and um i've heard great feedback from um from the people who are taking it they've really really enjoyed it and it's had a, it's had a big impact we've also required all the employees to do the gender-based analysis plus course the online course as well um, but um you know sk creek is just starting we won't be going into production until 2025 so we still um yeah we're still growing we still have a lot of work to do um but it's one it's great to work for a company that uh, that really believes in um in inclusion and diversity and who is um, is doing the work in um, for um, you know trying to um, implement UNDRIP into and trying to implement Taltan values into mine design? It's it's really exciting. <laughs> that sounds exciting. And for those of you that don't know, but I'm sure most of you do know because you're probably mainly in in the mining sector as you listen to this webinar. But the um, Skeena Resources. Um, project as well as, um, you know, is located in the um, Golden Triangle, which is located, 
in the Tall Tan tr traditional territory. So there is a lot of mining activity taking place in your territory from early exploration to advanced exploration to uh, mine development. And it just seems to me as an, as an outsider, someone who is Indigenous but is not Tall Tan and doesn't live in that territory, that Skeena is seeming to lead the way to, to set the bar and um, help other companies. And, and in addition to that, Tall Tan has their, their protocols, which um, companies must abide by, must um, work together with the Tall Tan. So when we look at that, do you, do you share my opinion, um, Frida, that, that Skeena is leading the way in terms of building that working relationship um, with the Tall Tan? Yes, absolutely. Um, it's really great to work for. Uh, this, is, this is basically my, been my dream employer <laughs> for my career. Somebody who is a, really embraces, um, you know, and, and, and is, is determined to, um, to, to utilize the local workforce to, to help Tall Tans become entrepreneurs and, um, and to incorporate Tall Tan values into, into everything we're doing. So it's, definitely not easy um you know we really have to think outside of the box i really feel um I, we have a lot of young um employees that that are on our team which is really great because <laughs> we really need that uh that fresh perspective um but yeah it's uh it's they're a great employer and it's i'm having i'm having a great time I'm towards the end of my career now and this is a great place to be <laughs> great well thank you for saying that frida so let's switch it back to Carrie and have a little bit, your approach is a little different. You're finding um, women who are indigenous to uh, participate in your pro program from across Canada. So, you know, there might be a few women here in the Tall Tan Territory that are interested, you know, in Diamonds in the Rough. And I know Diamonds in the Rough is only one segment of what you do. So maybe talk a little bit more about your consultancy and what you bring to, uh, to a mind that is, is, is maybe I'm wondering, how can we be more um, uh, inclusive of Indigenous people? We're really not sure how to go about it. Yeah. So I, like I said, I, I do uh, work for myself and uh, do all sorts of, of uh, different consulting jobs uh, across, uh, across Canada, actually. I'm working for one Indigenous organization right now where we work on building capacity with fire and life safety programs in Indigenous communities across Canada. Uh, there are, what is it, 600 and... About 660, yeah. Yeah, and it's it's crazy to think of of where we're at with Indigenous communities and their fire and life safety programs. Uh, we're just we we don't have a, a standardized approach across Canada for these for these communities, and uh, I, I it's been such a rewarding job working working with that organization. Uh, for myself, I uh, with some of the other consulting I do, I'm, I'm doing a lot of uh, safety training first aid training, uh, mine rescue training as well. And with, within Saskatchewan and Northern Saskatchewan specifically, there are a, the bulk of the employees or the, the, the workforce that's local are Indigenous, but I'm not seeing a lot of Indigenous people at uh, you know, management levels. Often they come in in, in, uh, in the very front frontline entry level positions and we don't see a lot of people moving up that chain uh, as much as as much as I would like to see and and the, those are some of the conversations I have when when I'm working with these companies uh, I, I've uh, experienced in the past one uh, training course and it was very much teaching you how to move up the ladder, how to progress your career. And the takeaway from it was you really need to uh, basically be savvy and toot your own horn. As Indigenous people, that's not the way we do things. Um, very much do your job and uh, if you do a good job, you will be acknowledged and you'll move forward. So instead of trying to change the top of the pyramid and the way that they uh, interacted with culture, we're trying to change the bottom of the pyramid in the workforce 
to change their culture and their way of doing things to move ahead in a company, um, which is very hard to do when you've got uh, a culture of people who are, you know, we we don't toot our horn. That's not something that we we do. And I think that's one of the reasons it's taken a, a lot longer for us to be acknowledged and recognized because uh, as we know, we haven't been heard. And so in the in industry, it's become even more difficult to see people get into those management positions. Um, I recently worked in a one one with one company where we were training a mine rescue, and uh, the the most engaged people were some local indigenous uh, indigenous men who just loved mine rescue, wanted everything to do with it, but with the standardized testing that they use provincially for mine rescue. The language, I mean, even when I did it, some of the some of the terminology, I'm like, what the hell does that mean? And so when you've got somebody coming in who speaks English as a second language, uh, it's even more difficult. Um, and once I once I broke it down into a language, you know, terms that were more relevant um, and, and explained them. Yeah, absolutely. You ask them the question in a, in a different format. They absolutely got it. You know, 100%, they knew exactly what I meant, they knew exactly what to do, but if they're doing the written test, the language is too difficult and too tricky to navigate. So one of the conversations I had there was just, you know, talking about English as a second language for, for a lot of the people that were highly engaged and wanted to do the job, they were actually a, a lot more engaged than some of some of the other people I, I had in the course and uh, some people were voluntold unfortunately um, but uh, with that it's it's uh, it, I, breaking it down was very important because we can't we can't expect people to change their language um, to to change their cultural values the way that they they work uh, in order to, to, to succeed by our stereotypical standards of what's, what, what succeeding means. And uh, that's another thing that uh, we really need to recognize as well is our definition of success. I worked with one person in particular and he was a carpenter. He was a fabulous carpenter and he wanted to just be a carpenter. That's all he wanted to do was work with his hands. And there was, because of some of the targets that they had with diversity in the company, they really wanted him to try new things, do pub, you know, run some meetings. And uh, he didn't want to do that. And because there was so much pressure, he ended up leaving the company, which was very unfortunate because he was very good at his job. So succeeding to different people mean different things, right? And we need to also acknowledge that. Um, so there's, there's the balance there of, you know, acknowledging people who do good work and working with them in a succession plan that works for them, as well as, uh, you know, not just pandering to the squeaky wheel and uh, we really need to acknowledge that the cultural differences can impact the way that we, that we see the value in people, the way that we need to interact. Um, and we also need to be strongly aware of all those microaggressions that go on in, in the workplace as well, which are still uh, pretty unrecognized from what I've seen. And uh, there's, there's so many conversations that need to take place. Uh, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, I guess, respectful workplace and cultural awareness training programs that I've participated in don't talk about those microaggressions. So uh, in one instance, I was in a coffee room and there was a bunch of men uh, who were talking in their language. And they were told by a supervisor, speak English. And it's like, why don't you take the time to try and learn their language instead of trying to get them to speak yours so you understand better? They were English as a second language. Why should they not be, especially on a coffee break, be allowed and not judge for speaking their own language? Uh, there's so many different little things that really are what break a person down in the industry and get them to seek employment elsewhere uh, because they want to be comfortable and celebrate their culture in an environment that welcomes that, that's inclusive. 
right? As, uh, as, as Frida mentioned earlier, so, or yeah, so. Great, thank you for sharing your thoughts, Carrie, on that. Frida, you mentioned earlier about on track the um, skills inventory that you developed. Maybe you can share with our audience a bit more about the on track program. I think your mic is off right now. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> um, so um, I on track came. I I started thinking about um, on track. It, back when I worked at SK Creek the first time. And I really I seen our local employees and I, I really thought they, they were very skilled and, and, and those skills weren't being seen. Um, and I think people in Northern remote communities, well, not just Northern remote, but people in remote communities have to be very resourceful. Um, we don't have, we can't call people to come and fix our plumbing or, <laughs> or fix our quads. We, we kind of have to figure out those things ourselves. And, um, and Indigenous people are, are very, very, um, are problem solvers on the land. If you, if you spend any time on the land, you really have to, um, you, know, you have to be very aware of your surroundings and you really have to be resourceful when, when you're trying to do anything because you, you don't have any resources to do them with, right? So I really recognize that and I, um, as a, as a business student, um, I also seen that um, hiring the local workforce was, you would save a lot of travel dollars, right? And I was also, um, we were facing a skill shortage in the, I think around 2006 or seven and, and the indigenous workforce stayed. So there is so much value there, but I didn't think they were being seen <laughs> for what they can do. So um, I asked my employer if I could research um, different ways of assessing skills and, and uh, Barrick, they were great. They, they let me do that. And I found um, TAOS, Test of Workplace Essential Skills, which kind of assesses, um, it assesses problem solving skills, but the really great part about it is um, they, have not, they have essential skill profiles in the National Occupation Codes database. So you can literally see <laughs> if someone has the skills, who, somebody who might not have ever been an underground mine production worker um, could have the essential skill level, which means he has the skills to perform the tasks in the job. So with some training, you could hire somebody locally and save a lot of money, be safe in a skill shortage. And, and, and Indigenous people have a vested interest in a project. Like they, you know, they, they will want it to succeed. They will want it to um, remain in environmental compliance. Like there's a whole lot of reasons um, that Indigenous people are invested in, in what goes on in the territory. Um, so that's that's how on track came into it came into being. Um, it took a really long time. It took 16 years. <laughs> um, but we created with essential skills group. Um, they they did the software a part of it, and um, we did the um, we we created um, the somebody can create their resume on there. Um, all their certifications, their education, and and all that too. In addition to doing a test, and employers um, sign up to be an employer on, on track and they can post jobs and people can just apply with the click of a button. And we can also see if, if um, we can see who's applying uh, and if somebody who's, who has the skills um, isn't hired, we can see that too. So that's a, that's, a, that's a good quality. It's been created for mining industry to support our IBAs and to help, um, help industry see our workforce in a different light. Wow, that sounds good. So, so now I'm just going to turn the discussion just a little bit and turn it towards each of you personally and talk about um, where you are today. I know you're both Indigenous and I know you're both women, but what stands out to you most as more challenging, being a woman in the industry or being Indigenous in the industry? And maybe I'll start with you this time, Frida. Um, well, I started in 1994, so things have changed a lot. <laughs> um, I remember being told um, quite, quite blankly that women did not belong on the mine site, and much less an Indigenous woman. Um, so um, things are much better the, today um, than, they were, than they were back then. Things are improving through my eyes. I also work with some, some young women that are in the industry now as part of our team. And you know they, they 
they see things like they they haven't had my experience of of seeing things back in the day and i think it's i i think i really love their perspective and i love hearing about it um because because mine's so different but yeah they face different challenges as well um but for me they're changing and they're improving and and i'm i'm very grateful for that i get to see the change <laughs> great thank you frida carrie what is your experience being and um as an Indigenous person and as a woman. Your microphone's off. I just realized that. Um, some of the biggest challenges are just recognizing the differences. There's a lot of different uh, characteristics that are in eight, but a lot of the things that are, you know, a lot of the gender norms that are out there are things that uh, have been learned over time. And uh, I've often heard, oh, well, you know, you, women are better at doing that because, you know, it's just natural. Well, not necessarily. Um, there's, there's different, it, it's acknowledging what the differences are, but also realizing that it's learned, it's, it's learned in our society. So people saying that need to realize that they believe that because it's what they've been exposed to. Um, and we look at the example of when I was graduating from high school, uh, my guidance counselor at the time thought I should be a nurse or a teacher. Um, I graduated at the top of my class and my interest was in science. Uh, but that wasn't something that was really fostered. And it was very, you know, a a very traditional role for women to be a teacher or a nurse but in the same aspect they didn't really acknowledge that you know nursing is a great job for men so is teaching and really looking at all those different gender norms and the awareness on it really pigeonholes women into positions that they don't necessarily want. I had a conversation not that long ago with some, some male friends that are in the industry and they're like, well, women don't want to do that role. I mean, yes, they do. You know, they want to do different roles. Um, one of my friend's uh, daughters, she's 22 years old, or no, 21 actually. And she just became um, first underground driller that they've ever had at this one company. Um, just last week, she got signed off on, on, on drilling, which is phenomenal. And she's a very small statured woman. She's, uh, you know, maybe 130 pounds soaking wet, but she can physically do the job. And for people to say, well, they don't want to do that. She's very proud of what she does. She loves what she does. So to say that women don't want to do that, the only reason women don't want to do that is because it's never been fostered as something that they, they could do. Um, the, the other challenge is we don't see women in those roles, so it's hard to picture ourselves there. Right. So having those those mentors in those roles um, and uh, we're often because of the way that we're 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 raised and what we're exposed to environmentally, we're also kind of taught to be competitors instead of allies, because there's only so many seats at the top for women. But really, when we finally break that glass ceiling completely, we're going to have a boardroom filled with women. You know, and it, it shouldn't make a difference um, whether it's full of women or men or a combination of both. Uh, who sits at the top should just be the most qualified people. But we just, we, we aren't there yet because we're competing against each other rather than finding those allies and those mentors there that can help us along the way. So finding, finding the um, allies is very difficult. Seeing people in those positions so we can actually realize that that is something that's achievable not just men supporting women but women supporting women and acknowledging as well that these are things that women want to do because those gender norms are something that's influenced it's not inherent um, you know so so those are some of the challenges that I'm seeing and really making the awareness about that um, forefront and having people talk about those conversations. Uh, I myself, I'm very outspoken. And I found that one of the things that I sacrificed when I when I worked in industry was becoming a person that 
I didn't necessarily always liked because when I went in there, because it's a man's world, you got to strike first. So they, you know, so you're not, um, so you don't feel uncomfortable. And I found myself becoming quite aggressive. I'm sure a lot of my former coworkers would agree with me, uh, where you try and embarrass somebody first before they can embarrass you. Um, and people were quite shocked when I would speak up because that's not what women do. Um, I, I had one, one guy particularly, and uh, great, great guy, great friend of mine, but we had a conversation you know, three or four years in, into uh, meeting each other and working together. And he's like, you know, when I first met you, I didn't like you. He's like, I thought, geez, the mouth on this woman, what the heck? And he's like, but you're awesome. I was like, well, thank you. He's like, and you just talk like everybody else here. So um, it was, it was really good to have him come to realize that, you know, women don't necessarily fit that standard role. I was also um, chastised one time because I used a, a little bit of colorful language and I was told uh, by the person after you know, I got hauled into HR um, <laughs> and uh, I, I approached the, the person later. I said, you know, I'd really appreciate it if you, if you would talk to me first. Um, I'm sorry, you know, if you, you overheard that conversation that wasn't intended for for, for other ears and uh, I'm sorry if I offended you. And he's like, well, I come from a day and time where ladies don't swear. And I used some colorful language there because I was a little offended and said, well, first of all, I am no bleeping lady and uh, thank you very much. At which point he didn't talk to me for six months. But afterwards we actually became good friends as well. So uh, recognizing that what you what you permit for men should be permissible for women as well. And I often, during a lot of my public speaking, I, I bring awareness to how we treat men as well. So if you need to look at how you're treating the men and how you're treating the woman, if there's a difference, you really should look at how you're treating both. Because I've seen a lot of situations where men are told to man up, men are told to um, basically uh, not be wusses or, you know, or just fit in. And uh, some of the conversations that go on are not comfortable for them, them either, but they can't speak up because then they're told, you know, they're gaslighted and said, you know, what's your problem kind of thing. So uh, really we need to look at both um, all genders and, uh, figure out, okay, what is respectful? And do we need to change the way that we're interacting, perceiving, and, and working with all these different genders? And uh, biggest thing when it comes to women is if that was your daughter, how would you feel if she was treated that way too, right? So yeah, and I think I think what I'm hearing sort of in summary, what you're saying is, we really need to learn how to be authentic. Absolutely. And, uh, and have people accept that as our, this is who we are, our authentic selves. Yeah. And I think, you know, in the workplace, we can kind of couch that sometimes. And part of that couching is maybe we, we, um, we want to be respectful of, of, you know, whoever is in the room, but you know, it's a balance, it's a balance, but in all of that, we have to learn how to um, be respectful of ourselves, not be afraid to put ourselves out there and to be authentic. You know, so it may mean speaking up more and having our voices heard. It may be maybe at times speaking with less color <laughs> and maybe at times it, it requires us to be more colorful. But I think it's, it's an intelligence that begins to to grow within us, you know, in different situations of, of how we may um, present ourselves and uh, want to be heard. So I'm going to come back to you in a moment, Carrie. But Frida, you, you have mentioned several times that you've been in the industry since 1994. And then you said something in your last um, uh, go around about um, ha having young people on your team. Is it Lana's um, in internet that's a problem or is it mine? I think it's Lana's. So we'll just give her a few seconds and uh, she'll come back to us. Sorry about that. Okay. 
So how's your day, Frida? <laughs> <laughs> it's good. We're very, very busy. <laughs> yeah. Have you uh, just, have you seen some of the same things that I've, I've experienced in the mining industry at all, or? Um... I, think, I think I'm back. Am I back? Yes, you are. Okay. Yeah. So I just I, I, read that question. And let I'm, me continue yeah. on that thought. I don't know how much of the question you heard, but I just wanted to find out um, how has it been evolving for you coming to that place, you know, nearing the end of your career um, in terms of being a mentor, an ally, you know, what opportunities have presented themselves for you as a tall tan woman? When I um, started with Skeena, we, it was three women that were like in their 20s and three women who were over 50 and two middle-aged men. So it was quite the team. <laughs> and um, uh, the, we had so much capacity. The, the young women that are on our team are so bright and so smart and, and, um, and, and bold. I, I, I really enjoy working with them a lot. And they're, you know, they, they, um, they're, they're very interested in my story and my history and, and also, um, you know, my, my traditional knowledge. So I've been able to share that with them. And it's, it's been, it's been really great. Um, it's been, it's been wonderful to work with them. Sometimes I feel like a dinosaur <laughs> um, because I struggle a little bit with the, with the technology. I'm not as, as quick at it as they are, but um, they're very, they're very um, quick to, to help me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's been great. Um, and we're actually, I'm hoping to be able to um, find a mentee, like a, an actual mentee, uh, a, a young Indigenous woman that I can, I can pass on, you know, what I've learned in the industry, because um, I'll probably be leaving it in maybe 10 years or so. <laughs> And we all know that 10 years goes by really, really quickly. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Unfortunately, but it does. So Carrie, I'll switch over to you now. And you had been talking about um, a lot of different things, but you know, when it comes to you and your career, have you had an opportunity to be a mentor or um, an ally for women, Indigenous um women? Yes, I have. I uh, Indigenous women and women in general, I've I've helped with uh, basically mentor uh, some young women who were in school and being uh, working on a mine site as summer students and really trying to trying to help them navigate the challenges that they're going to see um, and really trying to get them to speak up for themselves. And I will be the first one to admit when um, one of the first summer students I had. Uh, basically I told her, well, you just got to get a thick skin. And then I realized later on, no, I need to advocate and really support her and speak up that what was happening was just not acceptable. Uh, and sometimes like I, I found for, for myself that speaking up for myself wasn't something that was easy sometimes, even though a lot of people saw me as, you know, this tough nut to crack. Sometimes it was like, I can't believe that person said that to me, but I can't I can't show that it got to me because now they've got me pinned down and realizing that that was unacceptable and helping these women basically bring these issues forward and helping them deal with it in a way that was constructive and having those conversations with those people that uh, might have said something or acted in a certain way and helping them acknowledge that, um, that how uncomfortable it was and uh, really that, that they needed to treat people a little bit, bit better. Um, I've had the opportunity to uh, mentor some people, uh, a lot of women in, in uh, one of the organizations that I'm, I'm part of and helping them build those leadership abilities so they can, they can speak up and being that ally that recognizes when somebody can't and speaking up for them. I had a lot of difficulty when somebody wanted to speak up for me, a male ally, that I was just like, no, no, I got it. Just leave it alone. And realizing, recognizing later on that I should have accepted that, you know, and so trying to pass that on 
to some of these young women that they just, they don't have to do it on their own. Find those allies, whether they're male or female, and let them help you through it. Let them speak up for you if you can't, because, you know, we need to, we need to work together. We need as many allies as we can to, to help, you know, change the culture of, of the industry. So it is more accepting and uh, more respectful workplace. And it, it's been very rewarding working with a lot of these young women and also uh, very rewarding working with a lot of the male allies that I've found along the way. Um, I've had the great opportunity to meet a lot of men that were very, very supportive, um, very much uh, cheerleaders of, of having women uh, in, in the industry. My former mine rescue coach was fantastic. He didn't care what gender you were if you wanted to be there and could do the job he's like yes i want you on my team i could have you know a 300 pound really built man in mine rescue but if he doesn't want to be there and do the work he didn't want him on the team who cares if he could haul haul out you know a 400 pound guy on his shoulder it didn't matter because it was a it's a team um, environment. You need to work as a team. And if you have somebody who simply is just there to get, you know, an easy day at work, um, why would you want them there? Right. So right. Uh, having, recognizing that those allies are there, helping, helping young women recognize that those allies are there and utilizing them whenever they can. And also passing that knowledge down um, themselves as they move through. So it's been great. Um, I had one young lady uh, just last summer. She, we were, I, I happened to run into her in a social setting and she thanked me for what I was, was able to help her with. And that was very rewarding as well. So That's great. Well, listen, our time is, I think, almost at an end. I'm going to um, turn it over to Mary Lou for questions, but I, but I want you each to give a little sound bite about, you know, if someone asked you what is diversity and inclusion, to explain it in a way that's very non-technical, but just to help um, whether you're a mine executive or an HR person to better understand from an Indigenous perspective, what is, and I'll put the word equality, but what is equality, diversity, inclusion to you? in your own definition. And I'll start with Frida. Um, to me, it's, it's, um, it's, it's relationship, it's caring, um, and it is uh, being genuinely interested in, um, in, in another person. Um, the first time we worked at SK Creek, it was, uh, it was a very in inclusive atmosphere and it was a very safe place to work. Um, and, and we, we all felt heard and we all felt cared about. Um, and it was, it, it showed itself in, in many ways um, by being safe. We, win, we won safety awards. Um, many people started their careers like me at there, stayed there for many, many years. Um, yeah, it's about relationship. It's uh, relationship and caring. Great, thank you. And uh, what are your thoughts, Carrie? Can you repeat the question? Sorry, my mom's phone was going off. <laughs> <laughs> I just want you to explain what equity, diversity, and inclusion means to you as an Indigenous woman in mining. Um, well, diversity, again, we want to see those mentors in those roles that are Indigenous and female. Um, equity, it's it's recognizing those, those subtle differences, like uh, the cultural differences that I explained before. Um, and, and recognizing that that may, may impact the way that we interact with different people on site, not being able to toot our own horn is different. So recognizing those cultural differences, um, really goes a long way to, uh, you know, acknowledging a person's strengths and finding out what they want to do and moving them through that succession plan, whatever it may be, not looking at that traditional corporate culture of tooting your own horn in order to get ahead. Um, and when it comes to inclusion, an inclusive environment is, is not just recognizing that, but having those allies speak out and uh, really look at the way that we train people on 
uh, inclusive environments, whether it's respectful workplace or, or cultural awareness sessions and talking about those microaggressions and how harmful they can be. Um, because often it's not, I mean, there's outward racism, there's outward sexism that people can acknowledge, but it's, it's, it's those subtle differences, um, those subtle everyday microaggressions that can really break down a workplace culture and make it very uncomfortable. Um, everything from infrastructure to action. Um, it, it, it's, uh, and I'll just give an example of, of infrastructure, which, which was very disheartening. Um, I was working at uh, a site and they were building a dry um, for men and for women. And uh, the men had like 400 lockers in it in the plan. And for the women, there was 20 lockers. And I was like, well, why do you have so few lockers and spaces for the women? Well, we'll never have that many women was the answer. I'm like, well, with that attitude, you won't. So really acknowledging that, looking at, um, you know, taking things like that gender-based analysis plus uh, program, being able to become self-aware and creating that inclusive environment and recognizing that if your goal is to have a diverse workforce, look at, look at all aspects, infrastructure, how we talk, how we, how we um, acknowledge the cultural differences, learning about those cultural differences rather than forcing a cor corporate culture, traditional culture onto people. Uh, inclusion is so critical uh, to creating that diverse, diverse workforce and retaining that diverse workforce. Um, women don't stay in mining for very long. And a lot of times it's because of those small, subtle differences. So um, I'd like to see a more inclusive environment so we can get to the diversity that we wanna see. Um, and really looking at for the equity side is um, putting those systems in place, whether it's changing languages for testing or whatever, um, letting people um, accommodating those differences. So. All right, thank you, Carrie. Uh, Mary Lou, um, you may have some questions for us. Um, I don't see any questions yet, but thank you everyone. Um, a, a lot of the attendees did put, um, you know, expressed um, their comments on uh, what was being said and um, they, they thought it was, uh, you know, some, some great uh, feedback there. Um, there's no questions as of yet, uh, but a lot of back and forth and uh, with feedback. Great. Um Sorry, sorry to interrupt. I actually believe there is a question okay. for Frida in the chat. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Cassandra. I help behind the scenes pulling this together. So thank you, really Cassandra. Appreciate. I missed it. Thank you. Oh, no, no problem. And, and I guess while I have the floor, I just want to express my thanks to Frida, Carrie, and, and Lana as well for your time this morning and, and some really insightful comments that you were sharing with us. Um, the question that was posed from Holly to Frida, and uh, she was wondering how long of a process it's been to incorporate and build capacity uh, of local Indigenous members to become part of the workforce to achieve the 21% mark. And had Skina been doing this uh, for a long time before you became part of their team? And, and then she shared a comment with, with her experience working in mining in northern Manitoba um, and, and a similar situation that's, that she's experiencing. Hi, Holly. Thank you for the question. Um, it, it, it's been, it's been um, quite a, it's been a long process. The, when SK Creek operated the first time around, um, we maintained 30 to 35 percent Taltan um, Taltan employment. So um, Taltans are very familiar with mining, but I think looking at the looking at the indigenous workforce skills differently definitely helps. <laughs> um, and that we there was a, we we often um, hold what we call boot camps. Um, we start like I think we, the first one was oh, quite a while ago when the transmission line was going through. They help. Um, 
it's a certification programs. I think there's about 23 certifications that qualify people for entry level jobs in um, in the mining industry. We try and hold them um, as often as we can. And um, part of the program is also, um, you know, through the process, you get to find out where people are at. And working with the working with the workforce where they're at, I think, is really important. It's time consuming and it's um, it's it's a lot of interaction, like personal interaction. Um, but our communities are small, so it's definitely doable. Um, so you'll be able to find out where where uh, while while people are getting their certifications for entry level jobs, you get to find out where they're at, and then they might have to come back the next year and the next year. Um, but eventually, um, you can you can get there. So I've found it's um, you know recognizing skills for uh, recognizing those land-based skills and valuing them in the workplace helps and training programs. We're actually very lucky. We have um, we have an education and training program. Um, I think Cassandra Puckett's here. She's our education and training director. Um, and so we have our own funding for training programs as well, the Teltan, it's, it's our own dollars. Um, it's our own self, uh, self revenue. And so we're able to, work with employers um, and and if they find an employee that that they value and they would like to train we can help them do that financially um, we can support those support those employees as well internally so it's um we're at a great place but but yeah i think looking at skills differently and offering training programs are are what is what it takes and a lot of personal interaction and helping people move forward from where they're at Great, thank you so much. Oh, and thank there, you, Cassandra. The, oh, no problem, Holly. Thank, thank you for posting the question. Um, and there is one more question from Beverly, and I, I don't want to pronounce incorrect, incorrectly, but uh, I think she's asking about how to um, how how to pronounce or how to. I'm assuming it's a typo, or maybe it's not. How do you say your pronouns in the Squamish language? Um, I'm not You're sure. Correct. How... That that was a typo, Cassandra. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I meant what I meant to say was um, I'm so used to Microsoft Teams, so I'm I'm a little bit uh, I'm floundering in Zoom here. But what I meant to say was how do I spell it? Does anybody know how to spell it? Oh, okay. And yeah. like say the she, her, they, yeah. them pronouns? Yeah. yeah. That's a fascinating question. Um, we don't have anybody on the call from the Squamish Nation, hey? No? Okay. Well, I will find out and I will let you all know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. And I, I don't see any other questions, certainly some really good comments uh, focusing on the discussion and, and, and the path forward. So from myself on, on behalf of the CIM, um, I, I certainly want to pass on my appreciation and, and gratitude for everyone's time this morning. Yes, thank Great. you, thank you uh, um, to you both for the opportunity to speak. It's, uh, Topic very near and dear to my heart, and it's it's always good to create awareness and uh, really looking at the pan or everybody that's joined. You know, um, because they've attended, you know that they're likely allies, and it's great to see that. So, very much appreciate it. Thank you. Well, we will be having another session uh, in May on May 18th. It's going to be with Colin Webster from Alamos uh, Gold. And Colin has won this year's PDAC Skookum Gym Award. So um, in the next few weeks, you'll be receiving an email and promotional uh, with the links uh, to join us again on May 18th. So thank you everyone for joining us and uh, uh, Lana for moderating, Frida and Carrie and Lorena and Cassandra for helping with all the tech and uh, the questions. Thank you everybody. Thank, thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Have a great day. Bye. You too, bye-bye.